Uh, well, good morning. I want to say a special good morning to the kids in the room. Hello. Uh, so glad you guys are joining us. We want to catch you guys up, uh, particularly just for a couple moments, and let you know that we're in a series uh, for the next couple weeks on the series of discipleship. We're going to be discussing what our command is, what we're called to do once we are saved, forgiven, redeemed. Uh, what's our purpose on earth? Why is he called us to live for him, and what are we about? Uh, so kids, that's what we've been talking about in, the, in this room, as you've been talking probably about very similar things in your room, is, is discipleship. And so I'm excited that you guys can engage in this conversation and, and discuss it with us. Well, um, I saw a staggering statistic yesterday as I was finishing up my sermon prep for today. Uh, I'll give it to you, and maybe we can do a little guessing game, okay? The Barna, Barna Research, I'm not sure if you've heard of them, they're uh, statisticians, they research statistics that have to do with church and um, uh, Christianity and things like that. So they just did a research a while back. They interviewed a thousand regular church attenders, okay? So people that go to church weekly, that's, that's who they are. They are not just, they don't just identify as Christian, um, but they are active churchgoers, you ready? The question they were asked is, um, what is the Great Commission? What are we called to do? What is the Great Commission? And they are asked two questions. Have you heard of the Great Commission? Are you familiar with that term? And then if you, if you had to identify it, like what is the Great Commission? Could you articulate it? Okay, thousand ch regular church attenders were asked that question. What percentage... What percentage do you think could answer, yeah, I know what the Great Commission is, and I could probably to some degree articulate it, maybe whisper to the person sitting next to you. What percentage of people can identify, I know what the Great Commission is, maybe not chapter and verse, but I know what the Great Commission is, I can tell you, I can tell you what it says. You got a guess? Uh, you're high. 17%. 17% of active churchgoers of a thousand, small pool base, but we're able to say, I know what the Great Commission is, I can tell you what it is. Real quick, what are the, what are the implications of that? What do we learn about the church and its responsibility and its active obedience from that little scenario? Here's what I think we're learning. Very few people are actually discipling someone else. If only 17% know the command, know what we're called to do, of that 17%, how many of them are actually obeying that command? Is that staggering? Is that scary a little bit? It is for me. I want us to be looking out for the next generation. and I want us to be preparing the next generation to go on for God and to live for him. Todd's been preaching at us for the last several weeks that the goal is multiplication. The goal is that I pass my faith on to my children who will pass their faith on to their children who will pass their faith on to their children. And if we're not doing that, if I'm not doing that, what hope does the next generation have? I forget who says this, but somebody says we're only one generation away from the churches being empty. And I think that's that's pretty accurate. But let me recap real quick so I can prepare you for what we're going to be talking about today. The last three weeks, we have laid the groundwork for you of what discipleship is. From now on, we're going to talk a lot more in depth about what discipleship looks like. We're going to get more practical from here on out. From here on out, we will continue to put more meat on the bones of the structure of what discipleship looks like. Like, what do you do? What is discipleship? We will move from philosophy to practice. In week one, we'll kind of walk you through the sheet that you re received a couple weeks ago. In week one, we told you that discipleship takes a relationship. It's DNA. Paul calls Titus his son. In week two, we told you that discipleship takes strength that only comes from the gospel. The good news is what it motivates us and empowers us to teach that good news to others. And then last week we told you that discipleship takes a team or a structure. And we told you about, uh, Todd used the illustration of a rope and how we need each other and we need to ask for help and we need people to pour into our lives along the rope in order to help us 
move forward in, in what sanctification looks like. So this week, we want to help you see inside a discipleship relationship, help you see it uh, in practice, and see exactly what is happening when discipleship is taking place. We're calling it today the command of discipleship. Our title today is the command of discipleship. We're not telling you today, we're not teaching you today that you should disciple. We're not talking about that command, the, the great commission command. We're looking at our text in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, open up there. We're going to look at the command in that text. We understand, hopefully, hopefully we're not the 17%. Hopefully we know the command to disciple. The question we're asking today, what do you do when you disciple somebody? What's the command inside the discipleship relationship? How do we disciple? So what we're going to talk about today is what discipleship must look like in order for it to be successful. As I mentioned last week, Todd used a great example of what discipleship looks like. He used the rope. And he told about different relationships you need, different people who speak into your life to help you move forward. Today, we want to help you see what happens inside of those conversations, right? So I'm holding a knot, and somebody's holding a knot next to me, and I reach out for help. Inside that conversation, what is going on? That's what I think 2 Timothy uh, 2, verse 2 helps us see. Here's what discipleship is in philosophy. Now we're going to talk about in practice. Those conversations, those discipleship conversations, what is going on? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 has shown us what discipleship is. Now verse 2 is going to help us know what to do. If you notice in our text, verses 1 and 2, we haven't had a command yet. Verse 1 doesn't tell us anything to do. It helps us describe what it is. We haven't been told what we should do with someone else yet until today's portion. The very first imperative in the first two verses of chapter 2 is the word entrust. That's what we're going to look at today. One word, the word entrust. It's the first imperative in this description from Paul to Titus, uh, to Timothy, sorry, to tell him how to disciple The first command to teach him how to make faithful men is the word entrust. That's what we're going to look at. The first thing we learn to do when it comes to discipleship is to entrust, whatever that means. Regardless if you are discipling men to become elders or discipling your small children, I hope that you will see that discipleship is a matter of entrusting the good news of Jesus and to the lives of others. For some more clarification, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. The Great Commission, if you notice, those two verses, or that paragraph, I guess, 16 to 20, is set up the exact same way as 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. There is good news before there is an imperative. There is good news before there's a command. And the Great Commission says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. There's good news before there's an imperative. Same thing in 2 Timothy 2. There's good news before there's an imperative. The Great Commission uses the word teach, right? Uses the word teach. And last week, Todd helped us see that the best teachers in the world are people who not only lecture, but are people who also demonstrate and then immerse you into the culture they are trying to impart to you. Today, we want to help you see all of this is for the sole purpose of entrusting. So please don't think that 2 Timothy says we should teach, we should be orators, and then uh, um, 2 Timothy tells us we should do something different, this entrusting thing. No, I think these words are synonyms. I hope they're seeing, uh, helping us see that this idea of discipleship flows throughout the whole New Testament of exactly what we're supposed to do. And entrusting puts a little bit more flesh on the bones. So it is fair to say that our text in 2 Timothy is very much in agreement with what the Great Commission commands us to do. We all know that the Great Commission isn't a command to all of us to be orators or lecturers. We know that the command is to pass on something to someone, right? 
I don't think we think, anyone in this room thinks, the Great Commission was only for pastors. I hope you don't think that. Or the Great Commission was only for the 11 disciples. I hope you don't think that. The Great Commission is a command to all of us. And then 2 Timothy helps us see entrusting makes it a little bit clearer. Todd showed you this slide last week that teaching involves three elements. It, te- it, it involves audible, visible, and communal. That's a great description of the word entrust. If you're going to entrust somebody with something, use those three words that we looked at last week to help you understand a little bit of what's involved in an entrusting relationship, not just a lecture. Today, I want to show you how all of this fits into the word that Paul uses, the word entrust. So if I'm going to be clear or honest, we're doing pretty much a word study on the word entrust today. Can I give you the etymology of the word entrust? The word entrust is kind of foggy. I had a little bit of difficult time finding where the word entrust comes from, doing a little bit of background on it. As far as I could find, the word entrust is a financial term comes from the banking world. It literally means to pay a down payment or to put in something, to put money into an account. It seems similar to a trust that your grandparents would set up for you when you were a child. Seniors, hopefully you have a couple of those, and you should thank your grandparents if you have any of those, right? Your grandparents see this cute little baby, and they're like, that kid is going to pay for in college. I'm going to help him out now. And they put a 20 spot in it into a trust, right? And they hope that it builds and builds and builds over time. That's similar to the word entrust, to take something and put it into and in hope that it builds and grows and produces. So your grandparents put some money into an account with hopes that it builds throughout your life so that there is money there for you when a time comes that you need it. Your grandparents were investing in you or entrusting into you, hoping that there will become a time of need and you'll have what you need. Think of entrusting similar to investing. That's a term I'm going to use a lot this morning, investing. You see, people are willing to invest into people whom they love. Isn't that true? And we're going to talk about that. Almost every time this word entrust is used in the Old Testament, it is used in regard to someone trusting someone else with the responsibility of caring for something that has a financial significance to it. So in the Old Testament, it's not like, hey, take this money and entrust it into a bank account. It's more like, I'm going to take a person And I'm going to entrust this person with overseeing things of financial significance. Someone who's going to overlook or oversee things that have financial things involved in them. Let me show you a couple. First Chronicles chapter 9 has two accounts where it uses this word entrust. It says, for the four chief uh, gatekeepers who were Levites, these Levites were entrusted to be over the chambers and the treasures of the house of God. So there's things of financial significance, and they entrusted somebody or believed in somebody or put somebody in charge of things that had financial significance. And then later in the chapter, verse 31, and Mattathiah, one of the Levites, the firstborn of Shalom, the Korhite, was entrusted with making the flat cakes. What a great job. He was in, his job was to look over those and to make those. And so you can see the idea even in, of entrusting was, all right, there's something of importance. We need somebody to care for this and to look after this because it's very important. So we're going to entrust you with something that has high significance. Let's bring this back to discipleship. What does it mean to entrust when we talk about discipleship? Entrusting is so much bigger than to teach. We explained that to you. And it has the connotation of investing. It doesn't just mean to invest money. It means to invest something so much more valuable than money. So what possibly is of more value than money? Let's see by looking at a few New Testament passages 
that use the word entrust. Entrust is all over the New Testament. I picked a few to show you this morning, but if you just want to go to like esvbible.org and type in the word entrust, it will show you all the times this word is used. Let me show you a couple. Romans 3, 2. Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. This thing of high importance the Jews were entrusted with. Galatians 2, 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel... So we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our heart. 1 Timothy 1.11, in accordance with the gospel, the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And then 2 Timothy 1.14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. It's all over the New Testament, and the New Testament speaks of it differently than the Old Testament did. The Old Testament said, hey, trust this person to oversee financial resources. And then Paul takes the word in trust and makes it a discipleship term and says, no, 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 no. Money's not the thing of importance. You know what the most important thing in the world is? The gospel. The good news of what Jesus has done. This story, what Christ did, this amazing mystery... That's the most important thing in the world. And we need to entrust that good news to people and allow them to go to every ends and every corner of the earth and share that beautiful news with people. So what possibly is of more value than money? Paul says it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This good news, the story of Jesus that changed the world. So let's look deeper at this word in trust and see what we can learn from it. We're going to show you today three things that I believe the word in trust teaches us about discipleship, okay? So if you're taking notes, hopefully these will be clear for you. Okay, the first one, entrusting assumes an item of high value, okay? So let's just kind of walk through what is discipleship and how does this look through today? Entrusting assumes an item of high value. We always entrust something of high value um, instead of giving it away giving it away or throwing it away, right? We give away or throw away things all the time. I love Monday nights because that's dumpster night, and I am a throw awayer, right? I see it, it's going in the garbage can. I don't care what it is. But things that have high value, we don't give away or throw away. We entrust them to somebody to care for them. But these things, the things that we throw away, have low or no value, but things of high value, we entrust them. If someone were to give you something... They have something that you can have, right? You know instantly the intrinsic value of that item based upon how they give it to you. Think about this. If someone says to you, oh yeah, you can borrow my lawnmower, just swing by the house sometime and grab it. It's in the garage. Just whatever you need. Take whatever you need. Don't worry about it. Or if they say, okay, yeah, you need a lawnmower to borrow, come over to my house tonight I'll walk you through how to use it. I'll teach you about it. I'll tell you where I got it. Let me tell you the story, right? Right there, you know, oh, this is not just a lawnmower. This thing has high value to the individual. This is very important to them. I better care for it, right? Right there, you know, based upon how they described it to you in a second, you know, this is of high importance to them. They are entrusting me with this thing, not letting me borrow it for an evening. Is there anything of more value than the truth of Christ and the privilege of being his follower? So discipleship is passing this news on and helping people see the immeasurable value of Jesus Christ. Do you remember the parable, a story Jesus told, the parable of the treasure buried in a hill? It's a really interesting parable because it's only one verse long, and we're supposed to understand what it means. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it's the parable of the hidden treasure. It says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered it up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has so he can buy the field. 
That's it. That's all we're told. But I hope we see that the story of God is that treasure. The kingdom of God, the beauty of the gospel is that treasure. And if you wanted to share that secret of this hidden treasure with a friend, wouldn't we share it with joy and amazement and excitement? And wouldn't we meticulously share every single detail of the treasure that we found? You wouldn't reluctantly be like, hey, if you ever want to know about a treasure, come and talk to me about it, I guess. No, you'd, with excitement, you'll never believe what I know. You'll never believe what I have found. It's amazing. It's worth everything. Get rid of everything you have. We found the most precious thing in the world. What about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. We're the jars. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The gospels are clear that the gospel is a treasure. It's the most valued possession in the world. And if you're going to share it, it requires entrusting. Discipleship is sharing or investing the greatest thing in the world, a treasure with people we love. Being a disciple of Christ is of immeasurable value and we should treat it as an amazing privilege and not a chore. But so many times it kind of creeps into that list of chores when instead if we viewed it as the treasure it is that is of more value than any possession we own, we would share it. One thing I've learned about discipleship before we move on is that you will never disciple until you see the immeasurable value of the gospel. The moment you see the immeasurable value of the gospel, discipleship becomes natural. The higher value you place on the gospel, the more eager you become to share it. That's some, something that only the Holy Spirit can do in our hearts. So you want a disciple? You want to share this treasure with the world? You've got to come to grasp that the gospel's of more value than anything else. We love to share news, and we usually share news that has high significance to us. Number two, what do we learn about entrusting? Entrusting assumes a careful handoff. And trusting assumes a careful handoff. We handle things we care about very well. We handle things with care that we find very valuable. Have you ever noticed that? Like your cell phone. Don't drop it. It cracks. Take care of it. Every time I let Finn play on my phone, don't drop it, buddy. Maybe it's the difference between hiring a moving company Compared to trusting your friends to carry your stuff. Depends on how much value you have on your stuff. Or think about the last time you moved. Which items did you wrap in blankets? Or which items did you have placed in your car instead of in the moving van? What's the difference? Probably the things that had high value, right? Those are the ones you cared for, you handled really well. Don't place it in the movie, man. That's got to go in my van, in my car. I want to take that. I'll, I'll take that one. Don't, don't let anybody touch it. It has high value to you. When you entrust someone with something, involved in the handoff is a lot of work and explanation, right? If it has high value to you, you put a little bit more care into it. Maybe it's when you hire a babysitter and you sit the babysitter down before you leave for the evening and you walk her through all the details that they will need to make the night go really well. There's a lot you need to know. The milk needs to be at this temperature. We, he likes his blankie above his right shoulder, his stuffed animal under his left arm, right? Like, don't mess this up. This is a really big deal. Why is there a difference between asking somebody to watch my guinea pigs, which you can have them if you want them, <laughs> compared to watching my kids? Why is there a difference? The difference is my view of the importance of the thing that they will be taking care of. My guinea pigs, I don't care about. Put them in the garbage can. I'm big deal. <laughs> my kids, blanky over the right arm, stuffed animal under the left arm. 
He likes the yellow blanket pulled up to his chest. Anyway, you get the point. You see, the gospel is of such high value when passing it on, it demands time, explanation, and clarity. Why? Because getting the gospel right is vastly important. It's the most important thing in the world. In the world. Clarity is vastly important when we talk about the gospel. This is why theology matters. Because it's so easy to get it wrong. Just a little subtle shift in the explanation. I have a friend of mine that I get to meet with every Thursday. And we have different religious um, beliefs. And the more we talk, the more we realize the thing we disagree on is subtleties. It's nuances. The more we discuss the gospel, the more we discuss what we believe, we're realizing we agree on a lot, but the nuances we disagree on. Therefore, we are coming to the conclusion we do not believe the same gospel. And it's nuances. It's wordings. It's definitions. Oh, when I say atonement, you think this. This is what I think. This is what I mean when I use the word atonement. It's so important to get it right. Discipleship demands an investment of time, an investment of effort, and discipleship demands even an inconvenience sometimes because we got to get it right. But, but it's worth it. Because the better we hand off the truth of Jesus, the stronger the disciples we will produce. Is it exhausting, parents, to constantly be discipling your kids? Yeah. Is it exhausting every night trying to find something else to read to them and to discuss with them and every night at the dinner table trying to bring up spiritual conversations? Is it difficult when you pick your kids up from school every day to be like, okay, what did you hear? What bad thinking do I've got to correct today? It's exhausting, but it's worth it. It's an investment. And the handoff is of utter importance. We can't be foggy when it comes to the clarity of the gospel. Lastly, what does entrusting teach us about a discipleship? And trusting assumes a long-term result. You see, when you entrust someone with something, you don't expect them to sell it on eBay next week, right? Wait, that's my lawnmower. Why is that on, why is that on eBay? Your hope is that they will cherish it as much as you did, right? That's your hope. Somebody gives it to you and their eyes are as big as saucers and they're like, here, this is for you. You instantly know, I got to keep this the rest of my life, Okay. All right, storage space. All right, I get it. You know that it's important to them and they want it to be important to you. And trusting's goal is a lifelong commitment. So discipleship's goal is a lifelong commitment to follow Christ. Children in the room, the reason your parents are investing so much time into you spiritually right now is because their greatest desire is that you will live for God for the rest of your lives. 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Oh, the older I get, the more true that verse becomes in my heart. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Parents in the room, isn't it our hope that the discipleship of our children will be similar to planting a tree? A lot of work on the front end and countless years of spiritual fruit. Have you ever tried to plant a tree? It's a lot harder than I thought. My first job, I worked for a nursery, and one day I showed up and there was a pickup truck filled with trees, and they said, there's this golf course that wants a little like privacy row. Can you take all these trees up there and eight to five, right? Go plant these trees, like six, eight trees, I don't remember what it was. 
go plant these trees. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds easy. Dig a hole, throw it in, right? No big deal. I quickly realized, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. They kind of showed me where it was. I didn't know how deep. I didn't know what to do and realized how difficult it was. But if I did a decent job, which I have no idea if I did, today those trees are still there, right? If I did my job, those trees are still there. Beautiful line of trees protecting the golf course, providing beautiful shade, a lot of work on the front end, and endless years of fruit. Isn't that the goal in discipleship? That we'll pour in, we will invest in, we'll spend time, we'll bring clarity, we'll help you during the most foundational, formative years of their lives. And then when they graduate seniors and you say, not goodbye, but the relationship changes, you'll be like excited to see the years of fruit that will be produced. That's what discipleship is. So discipleship's goal is to create followers of Christ who will live for him the rest of their lives, producing fruit for years to come. Seniors in the room. Not old people, but like <laughs> seniors in high school. Did you get that? Okay. Our heart's desire is for you is that the investment that we have made in your life will last a lifetime. But many times we don't know if it sticks until next year. That's the scary part of seniors. We invest and we invest and we invest and they kind of give us the head nod. Like, yep, I'm listening. I get it. Preach, Travis. Yep, I hear it. You're like, I'm not so sure. I'll find out next year. Oh, I'm nervous. And our prayer is that all the time that we've invested in you will create lifelong followers of Christ. And here's, I think, another thing I'm learning is that a good disciple maker helps others prepare for the long haul. My most important goal is not just they show up to youth group, but that 10 years from now I get to go to the wedding and get to hear their vows get to hear their love for God, and that's the greatest joy. I've been a youth pastor for 14 years now. I'm old, and it is amazing to see now kids that I've invested in, probably poorly, but I've invested in, and to see them going on for God and starting families and seeing some of them go into ministry and just be successful Christians. That has been a great joy. I want to look at one more example and then we'll wrap up. Our greatest example of entrusting is Christ's work with the disciples. Man, the gospels are so rich and so beautiful with Jesus explaining to us what we should be doing when it comes to discipleship. Christ's model of discipleship was always one of investing and entrusting his whole time. Christ invested his life into 12 men. He spent three and a half years sharing his life with his disciples, teaching them, modeling life for them, and immersing them into a culture of disciple-making. If you'll turn one more passage with me, Matthew chapter 16. This is a beautiful passage where Jesus proves that clarity is important. Jesus, all throughout his ministry, was explaining to these guys the gospel, what he was about to do, what he needed to do, and he made sure that clarity was important. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Peter, once again, is putting his huge foot in his huge mouth. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem that he would suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. 21, right? Verse 21. Guys, listen to the gospel. Here's the gospel. Here's what's got to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer by these men. I'm going to be put to death. I'll rise from the grave. That's what you need to know. Verse 22. And Peter took him aside. Jesus, come here, buddy. And began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from me, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, 
if you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of men. Jesus, all throughout his three and a half years, wanted the guys to get it. You got to know it. If you're going to go on and live for me, if you're going to ultimately give your life for me, if you're going to go on to start this church movement, if you're going to start and going to go to every corners of the earth and plant churches, you've got to get it. Peter, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Shut your mouth. You need to understand the gospel. And then Christ, when he, after Christ died on the cross, he rose from the grave and he spent what Acts 1 tells us, 40 days with the disciples. And Christ during that time was carefully handing this message off to the guys during his final moments with them. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says, and he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. He reappears to him. He says, Thomas, I'm alive. Look at my hands. Look at my side. Believe. Trust. Obey. Jesus spends time with Peter, even though Peter denied him three times and said, Peter, I love you. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Get this. Don't lose this. Jesus carefully entrusted the truth of the gospel to these men so that they would go on and live for him for the rest of their lives. And lastly, Christ entrusted the church to these guys. Jesus is the greatest example of a disciple maker because he entrusted so much to goofballs and failures. Christ entrusted the church to these men. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the end of the earth. He trusts these guys? These 11 with the church? He tells Peter in his last moments, Peter, you're going to lead this church movement, but it's going to cost you your life. Will you die for me? Jesus entrusts John with penning the revelation of Jesus Christ. The story of end times the story of things to come. He gives John this beautiful vision. He entrusts him with penning it with accuracy and clarity. Jesus entrusts Luke with authoring the acts of the disciples as they go on to plant churches, even to endure difficult persecution. And all of them will eventually give their life for him because of his discipleship and entrusting in their lives. Just as Christ invested his life into all the life of others, into the lives of these other guys, so discipleship should look pretty similar today, shouldn't it? Discipleship isn't just a six-week class. It's an investment of one's life to another. Really quick, I want you to, we've been working on these cards. I don't know if they're in the seat in front of you or not, but we've been asking you to wrestle with two questions. The first question is, who's discipling you? And the other question is, who are you discipling? We want to continue to help you think through who are you discipling. And our prayer and our hope is that names have been coming to mind, and maybe you just feel a little bit overwhelmed, like, I don't know if I'm discipling them. I don't, I don't know how to disciple them. That's, that's our goal, is to kind of bring some clarity to that. So I want to help you real quick. I want you to really quick th- think about three potential groups of people that are in your life right now that you could be discipling and help you think about what it would look like to be investing in their lives spiritually. For the parents in the room, obviously the first names you should think about are your kids. Parents, you get 18 years with your kids. This very week, we're usually reminded just how quickly those 18 years go parents when they graduate from high school can you with confidence say that you entrusted them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and boldly invited them to be followers of Christ or parents will you regrettably say I didn't want to force Christianity down their throats parents are you making disciples of your children the question is What type of disciples are you making? 
What investments are you putting into their life? Financial, time, effort, resources. What investments are you putting in their life this week? Parents, please know this. What we plant, that's what we will grow. View your children as an investment. Continue to invest spiritually into the lives of your kids, not just academically, not just physically, not just sports, not just school, not just socially. Invest in them spiritually. And please, parents, don't just drop them off at church and expect the church to disciple your children. That's your role. Your second category I want you to wrestle with, your friends slash coworkers. If you're like me, you talk to your friends about everything, the craziest, silly stuff in the world. We talk to our friends and coworkers about everything. Are we investing in their spiritual lives? Are you sharing with them the life-giving news of the gospel? Are you investing into what matters most? Or are you afraid of creating awkwardness? I don't want to bring it up. That'll make things weird. They're going to think I'm always trying to like bring them to church or something. I don't want to make this awkward. Make it awkward. It's the greatest thing for them. The greatest thing they need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last category, your neighbors. If you're like me again, I'm more than willing to help my neighbors out with anything, like yard work. They need to borrow a tool, right? He comes over, comes to the fence. I'm outside working. Hey, do you have, oh, of course. What do you need, man? Let me help you. You need to help, yeah, I'll help you out with anything. I'm more than willing to help him with anything he needs. But am I willing to discuss things of eternal significance with him? His son's graduating from Centennial this year. We talk about that. What's up, man? What do you, where's he going? What's the plan? Oh, that's awesome. Am I investing in him for eternal things? Please be praying for me about that. It's difficult. But I need to see him as a soul and not just a neighbor. So consider your neighbors, the people that you talk to and you help and you care for. Are you investing into their eternal soul? So maybe you could write down a couple of those names. We want to boil everything we've talked about today into a take-home truth. Our take-home truth today is this. Discipleship is investing the good news of the gospel into the hearts of others. And it is that good news that produces long-term faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.